Welcome back to another episode of The Meeting Place. This week's guest is Isla Wadwa. Isla just finished her fourth year at UTSC studying psychology, and she'll be back for one more year before graduating next summer. While at UTSC, Isla has founded the UTSC Mindfulness Association and been the co-president of a club called Hope for Humanity. Isla tells me about how these clubs have allowed her to spread the influence of the arts within campus life. We also talk about her time in the Council of Student Services and her desire to make positive decisions that impact all students on campus. Now, Isla and I recorded this interview back on April 28th, so by the time you're hearing it, it'll be almost a month later. So some of the provincial updates I mentioned about COVID-19 are a little bit old. Take a listen, and we hope you enjoy it. Today, my guest is Isla. Isla, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good as well. You know, you were one of the first people to listen to the podcast and email back and say you wanted to be a part of it. And because you had great experiences at UTSC. And Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you tell us about some of those groups you've been involved in? I know you've co-founded multiple clubs on campus. So what are those clubs? So um, one of the clubs I founded was Hope for Humanity. It's a fundraising club on campus. Uh, One of my best friends, she's uh, doing her master's in public health. So she started this club before she graduated. And then I kind of came in succession and I became a co-president of it. And basically, we just try to combine arts with fundraising because we believe uh, there's a lot of like STEM based clubs on campus and not a lot of arts based clubs trying to promote the arts while also trying to promote like children's education in third world countries, things like that. Yeah. And then the second club that I'm a part of, It's called Mindfulness Association. So it's practically the same thing in terms of arts, but we focus on mindfulness, spirituality, things like yoga, vision board, gratitude, journaling, things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. It's definitely, that sounds like a niche that um, you've been able to fill on campus because there are a lot of different clubs that help with academics, but it seems like you're very much helping people with the non-academic side of the university experience and making yeah. sure that they um, are happy and comfortable throughout their time at university. Oh yeah, definitely. I think one of my goals is to, I would love to reach out with health and wellness one day because they do a lot of the same things like mindfulness does, like yoga workshops and things like that. So I would love to like kind of partner with them and kind of do something, you know, student to administration. Mm-hmm. Well, and the university is always looking for partnerships with student groups. So mm-hmm. we should definitely get you in touch with health and wellness at the end oh, of this and, uh, and see what kind of programming you can you can help run for students, yeah. um, especially at this point in time where uh, the campuses change quite dramatically. We can't actually be on campus due to COVID-19. And so um, I'm sure that's changed uh how you know your club had to function towards the latter half of the term and we're definitely going to get into that at some point during our conversation today Mm -hmm. i am curious though about how you came to be involved in these organizations at the beginning or founding one and and being part of another one what was the motive for you to get involved in the extracurricular side of the university experience well there's a lot of clubs on campus so originally i was part of the indian student association and i kind of saw the way that they ran events and the the influence that they had um, over just the university experience. I think a lot of students enjoyed coming to their events and and I just, I think the organizational aspect of it, it was very, it was just very intriguing. So at first it was just Hopeful Humanity that was part of creating events with them. And then as I kind of got through my psychology major, I realized that mindfulness and mental health play a huge role in the health and wellness of students, right? So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what motivated me to kind of start mindfulness because I wanted to kind of help students in a different way and yeah, promote events and things like that. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, What are some of the types of events you've had on campus that you've been, that have been the most successful or the ones that you're most proud of? Well, we had a vision board event um, last semester. I actually got one of my classes. So I was in a really small English class and they had like an out of portion assignment and they all came to our event. And um, that was a really big success because basically you would take a, a piece of paper and print out images that you think that you want to accomplish one day. Like if you want a certain job, it's just it's a visual thing that people can 
use to kind of implement gratitude in their life. So that was a big one. And then we also have a yoga workshop coming up. Uh, yoga tends to do like really well, I think, because it's something that people can just like come in and leave and they don't have to prepare and print out things in advance, right? Mm -hmm. is, that, uh, is that something you're still planning on doing like online this summer? Yeah, we have another event on uh, Thursday at five online. Oh, wow. So they're, yeah. they're happening right now. So mm -hmm. it's the ones you've had online so far, how have they been? Have they, uh, I, I imagine the attendance numbers, I, actually, I can't really imagine what they would be. So are you getting a lot of students out to these? Yeah, I mean, the Thursday one is our first one. So because oh, of exams and stuff, a lot of people, we didn't want to like, um, we wanted kind of like a break with events because people are mm -hmm. transitioning to online learning and things like that. But I think now that exams are over, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I know I've said it before that, you know, they having to transition to online everything is kind of the way that we started doing this podcast in the first place. We wanted to still have a way for students to feel connected to campus. And mm -hmm. it's great that your group's still doing things like that as well. Um, it's That's one of the first groups I've heard actually to be doing an online program of any kind. So keep me in the loop. I definitely want to see how oh, that, how that goes because oh. we can, you know, talk to other groups about, um, about how that is going to work. So from the logistical side of that event, is that like a zoom stream or how are you doing that? Well, we're hoping to do a zoom stream. So it's going to be an hour long and then people can come in and, um, there'll be like some one person trying to lead the yoga it's beginners. So, I think hopefully oh, that works. We'll see. It's our first time using Zoom too. Oh yeah. Hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully that's Not super of... successful. Mm -hmm. So by the time this gets posted, that will have already happened. So hopefully uh, we'll have to get your updated info on the future yeah. workshops to come. So uh, people oh, can, definitely. yeah, people can be part of them once this does get posted. So tying the club to your academics, it sounds very much like you mentioned, you know, you're in, you're in a psychology. And mm -hmm. so, you mentioned that these things were of interest to you, some of the things you're doing in the club because of your interest in psychology and your program. Um, with the program that you're doing, what do you expect you're going to be doing long term as a career? Or, or do you even know? Because uh, I know it's, it's hard to know at you know, the age of 22 or something what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. But what do you think you want to do with your degree? Oh, I know. It's uh, to be honest, I I'm pretty sure I changed my major so many times, like at least two times. Since that happens so much, and I think people don't realize how often that does yeah. happen. But uh, what were you, the majors you were in before? So it was still psychology, but it was a specialist in psychology. Um, before that, I was doing a double major in psych and English, and then I switched to specialist in psych with a minor in English, and <laughs> now I'm doing which hopefully it's going to be like the final thing but now i'm doing um a major in psych and then a double minor in english and bio but the only reason i think i switched so much is because um you know you start university at like what 17 years old and you don't really know what you want to do long term so you're trying to experiment with things and um all the all those things right so i think um now that i'm like going into my fifth year I have a much more clearer understanding with all the courses I've taken. Like, okay, um, I'm not really interested in anthropology. I took anthropology electives, right? I'm really interested in biology. So I, you know, I got a bio minor and things like that. But hopefully for my master's, I'm hoping to do industrial psychology. Yeah. Industrial psychology. I don't even know what that is. Tell me about that. <laughs> it's psychology in the workplace. So think of HR. Yeah, similar to oh. that. Yeah. Okay. And so how did that become something you became interested in? Um, I think it's because I really enjoy talking to people and um, I'm not really interested in the clinical aspects of psychology. Yeah, I think it's because, yeah, I'm not sure why, but um, just the idea of like talking to people, being in social settings, um, I've always wanted a like office job. I know that's kind of weird, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not, not weird. That. Oh, no. Everybody wants what they want, and yeah. nobody should be judged for what career path they choose. That's true. Thank you. That makes me yeah, feel no, better. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Um, yeah, I mean, 
a lot of people would say I have an office job. I work at a university and I have an office. I sit in sometimes, but then I also go around to student events, see what's going on. I run some programming on campus. So yeah. things vary more than you, you might think when you, mm-hmm. you know, hear office job. I, although I imagine HR is a little more office-y than what I'm doing. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so with the extracurriculars you've been involved in, do you think those are going to benefit you in your future career? I definitely think so. I think uh, master's programs look at experience a lot. And at the end of the day, the things that you kind of organize an event plan with clubs, it plays a huge role with whatever you're trying to go into. So like if I, when I apply to my industrial psychology, I can kind of show that I implemented something in my events and um, brought it out to students and kind of bridge the gap between like clubs and like stu- the student body, if that makes sense. No, definitely. Yeah. The uh, real world experience is incredibly valuable. And so often, I, I know that it's kind of a big joke that, you know, entry level jobs want three years experience, right? Yeah. And, um, but this is the type of thing that you can do that will get you some of that experience. And it's, it's practical, real world experience. It's not just um, fun stuff where you're not learning anything. You're actually are gaining quite a bit of experience in event planning, communication skills, conflict management sometimes, um, how to lead in a group setting, simple things like how do you run a meeting, all that kind of stuff I think comes up in uh, group settings regularly. Uh, What are some of the skill sets in particular that you've really, you had to dig in and learn that you didn't expect you were gonna have to learn in this role or in either of your roles with groups? Yeah, um, I think I'm really lucky in the aspect that this ha- there hasn't been a lot of conflict management that I've had to endure, which I'm sure will change when you get into the job force and things like that. But um, yeah, I think like a lot of things was this responsibility and leadership. Um, I used to be really, really shy. Like even though I was semi extroverted, I was still really, really shy and I couldn't really like state my opinion and things like that. But with these club roles, you kind of have to like tell people, okay, in events, you're in charge of this, external relations, you're in charge of this. And I think that's incredibly helpful for when you apply for a job or when you interview, because now you know how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you know how to delegate as well, which is something that is, (laughs) yeah, that's no problem. It's definitely something that becomes useful when you're in the uh, workforce. Uh, something else that you mentioned to me before this that you're involved in was uh, you were a member of the Council of Student Services. So yeah. tell me about that because you're the first person that I've had on here that's been part of that group, or at least the first one who I've been aware of being part of that. And that council uh, is of interest to me because that is the council that directly funds all student services on campus. And mm-hmm. the pot of money that I use to pay for club events comes from that council. So uh, I'm a big supporter of the Yay. CSS, as we call it. <laughs> so tell me about how did you end up deciding to run for CSS? Because it is an elected position. Um, yeah. And so what made you want to run for that role? And, and what was the experience like on the council? Yeah. So basically, I'm actually really terrible with like anything governing or political science. So I wanted to get experience with that a little bit more. And um, the president of SCSU was like, we need, she made an announcement saying how um, they're looking for uh, undergraduate students as representatives for the CSS council. So I was like, okay, what better way to kind of learn these things to kind of jump into it, right? So, um, yeah, so I kind of, I emailed her and then she got me a spot on the council. I kind of learned how they did things. Um, it's really interesting, actually. Like, I didn't know the way that they allocate some of the funding or the way they make decisions, the voting system. It kind of reminds me of, like, the debate system that we used to do in high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, sorry, CSS, that is the appointed council. There's uh, a bunch of elected councils. Mm-hmm. There are, I think it's five separate levels of governance that can exist at UTSC. So it's so many councils, I can't keep track yeah. of how you get on each one, but um, well, that's really great. Like so <laughs> overall, I guess that sounds like that was quite a positive experience. And it sounds like it had to take you out of your comfort zone a little bit, but it seems like it was uh, of benefit. Yeah, I learned so much and um, 
because of the council, I was able to even go into the athletics council and kind of learn about how they run things at Pan Am. So um, it's, it was an incredible learning experience. And I'm so thankful that I was able to like jump into that and kind of learn how, you know, the UTSC governing system works. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, you know, the second part, what you said there about being part of the athletic council, isn't it so interesting, right? That only when you get involved in one thing, you find out that other things exist and yeah. um, you get to have all these different experiences because you sort of put yourself in a position to um, have those experiences, right? And I guess if, if you hadn't been a club president at the time, you probably wouldn't have been in a position to know that CSS was looking for students, right? Yeah, exactly. I think it all, it's like a chain event. I never thought of it that, about it that way. You know, I had the same thing happen to me in university and I had to kind of justify to myself how I was going to get a career by volunteering. Mm -hmm. And so I started to realize at one point, once one opportunity was offered um, because I'd been involved in something else and, and the new opportunity was paid, I realized, oh, like this actually, this is a chain that will lead to something um, more positive than I expected. And so uh, that's another reason why I would always encourage students to get involved in in one thing because mm -hmm. you, you might not know that uh, or the thing you get involved in might not become the ultimate thing that you're so interested in. But when you get involved in that, you might find something else along the way that you're interested in. So. Oh my God, I completely agree with you. I actually have like a family friend um, he works in the financial sector of like a bank. I think it's TD or something like that. But he was telling me that when they do the hiring, they look at a lot of experience. So if, even if you have like a lower GPA, um, if they think that you will be right for the job or if you have a lot of experience. So I think volunteer work would definitely be helpful. Yeah, not that I have... Um... Not that I'm discouraging anyone from getting a, a high GPA. It's you know no, definitely no, important, yeah. but no one has ever asked me what my GPA was uh, in a job yeah. setting. So once oh, you have that the degree, yeah. Now I will say for grad school, they're going to want to know your GPA. Oh, yeah. So uh, you might need to pay attention for that purpose. Mm -hmm. GPA is incredibly important. I agree with you, but I think like I, I think it's like a, a mix of both, right? So you don't want to neglect one or the other. Oh, absolutely. It's, you've got to find the balance, right? Mm -hmm. And that balance is not going to be the same for every person. It's going to be um, some people are going to gear towards more uh, the academic side of things and other people are going to go the other way. And there's going to be all kinds of people in the middle. And uh, it's there's no right. There's no mix. That's the perfect mix for every person of extracurriculars versus academics. So you've kind of got to just get in there and figure out what works for you. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So talking about uh, the way things are right now, um, we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, in March of this year, it's now late April, but in March, uh, you find out that suddenly your classes are shifting to online. You don't have to come back to the campus for the rest of the term. And being in a uh, club president, I imagine that impacts you on two fronts because you probably had events you were planning for that couldn't happen. Um, and obviously you've, you've mentioned, you've been able to transition some of those online. So that's awesome. But from the academic side of things, what was that transition like to suddenly not be able to be on campus every day or however many days a week you were there and have to study from home and take online courses? Yeah. Um, originally it was a bit difficult. I think it's still a little bit difficult. Uh, I assume for many students as well. Um, it was kind of difficult, especially with exams, because with in-person exams, uh, like I've been a student for four years now, so you kind of know what to expect. You go, right, you know the kind of difficulty that they're going to ask. But with online exams, you don't know if they'll make it harder because it's online or you just don't know what the format is. And that kind of makes it a little bit uh, anxiety inducing. Um, yeah, but I think with exams over, it wasn't too bad. And hopefully summer school with them being a little bit more prepared, knowing that they're going to be online, I think it's going to be a little bit of an easier transition. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, are you taking any courses this summer? Yeah, I'm taking five courses. Oh, okay. You're, it's a five full courses. term for you full this term, summer. Yeah. Not going anywhere. Yeah. You get to experience the, the real full summer term of, yeah. of online only. And uh, are, they, are they all four-month courses? Um, 
I'm still doing a couple course selection, but yeah, I'm hoping I don't want to do any accelerated courses because I think that's going to be too much. For, yeah, those can be a lot. I think. Yeah, so. I think five, four month courses. It's the same yeah, as a okay, semester. So you'll definitely be online for the entire summer. Yeah. So knowing that you're going to be online all summer long, have you thought about like how that impacts how you study, how you do work? Uh, I know for me personally, I'm sitting at what is normally my computer desk at home where I, you know, screw around on Facebook or watch yeah. movies or play video games. And mm -hmm. now I work from it for seven and a half, eight hours a day. Uh, has, do you have something like that where you realize you're going to be at the desk in your room most of the day studying all summer? Oh yeah, definitely. I think you train your brain in some aspect. Like when you go to school, you're like, okay, I have to study, right? I think you trained your brain in a sense. And then when you come home, you're like, okay, it's time to relax. But then when that, when those like two worlds get merged together, it's so complicated because you're, you're kind of confusing yourself. You're like, am I supposed, like the couch is right there. The bed is right there. I can just sleep, things like that. But yeah, um, I live uh, about an hour away from campus. So I used to commute and drive. Um, and then, yeah, so when you're driving an hour, you want to stay longer and study. And I used to just sit at the library and things like that. And then when I would drive home, I would just watch movies. And uh, now I'm like, what do I do? I have too much time. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. The difference because so I live uh, a similar distance with the traffic on the 401, yeah. um, a, bit, a little bit less. And for me, the extra time I have by not having to commute into work every yeah. day, both ways is amazing. Like at 501, I can just sit on my couch and I watch know. TV or whatever. It's, <laughs> uh, it's, I, I'm loving it. It's great. All that yeah. time not commuting has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's given me so much more time to do whatever I want, which is great. I'm, I'm catching up on movies, TV, all kinds of things. Uh, you need to give me which, some movie suggestions too. Cause oh, I, ran I out. will. <laughs> I made a list of 140 plus movies that were Oscar nominated best picture movies, uh, from the last like 35 years. And I'm going to try, I'm not going to get through all of them obviously, but, um, you know, in time maybe. Yeah. So, Oh my knows? gosh. That's mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. I, I definitely, I need to email you then. And be like, send me those movie suggestions. I should publish that. Maybe I'll become a film critic during yes. this COVID crisis. I'll support It's you. an opportunity for people to pick up hobbies they didn't know they were uh, interested in. And yes. so I've talked to some students and they've said, you know, they're getting back into working out or they're journaling now and they didn't journal before or they're singing again or practicing instruments they used to play. Uh, what types of things have you been doing to kind of keep yourself grounded and and uh, personally, I say keep yourself sane because it's it's weird to me. We can't go out as much as we used to, and you know, certainly not for social activities. Um, so, what type of things have you been doing? Um, I've was I've just been doing the regular things like working out. Um, I'm trying to do stretches every night because you know when you're sitting on a desk and working all the time, you, your muscles kind of get like stiff. Absolutely. Like yeah. And I'm an English minor, so I've been trying to read more books. I've been really bad with that last year. I read like two books the whole year, which is terrible. So I've been trying to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of lucky. I was, well, not lucky in the initial sense, but I was supposed to be uh, away on a bit of a trip during this whole crisis. Oh. So I had bought an ebook reader and uh, I got the Toronto Library app, Libby, so I can, I have a thousand ebooks I could read if, um, if I had the time for that. But uh, oh. it's great because I've, I'm finally getting to read some books that I've always wanted to read because now I, have more time for it and i don't need to go out and buy the book i can just rent them from the library which is great so do you do fun. do you listen to audiobooks i love yes so that is how i used to survive my commute to work every morning oh. i would do audiobooks in the morning and sports radio in the afternoon and uh so i have i have many many audible credits uh well books i've already purchased with audible credits but um a ton of them i still have to listen to yeah, I think that's so smart because I like to go and drive sometimes and I just listen to music, but I wanted to like start getting into audiobooks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll download Audible or something. 
Yeah, definitely. And I know they don't sponsor this podcast, but I do know that whenever uh, I listen to podcasts that are sponsored by Audible, they talk about how Audible has a free credit for everyone for your first uh, free book. So that's, um, that's that's how I got into it personally. Uh, at the time, my at the time girlfriend, now wife, was living a couple hours away um, back home, and so having to drive there to visit her on the weekends, I would listen to audiobooks going back and forth uh, on some weekends. So. Yeah that amount of time in a vehicle certainly gives you a lot of opportunity to listen to audiobooks. But then I sort of switched to podcasts part-time and, mm-hmm. um, and that was how I got interested in the idea of interviewing people because I was listening to all these podcasts where yeah. other people did that. And it seemed really interesting to hear people's stories, which is why I'm talking to people like you now get to hear about your experience at UTSC and how that's really impacted um, your future direction, you know? Yeah. What kind of podcast do you listen to? Uh, there is a guy named Mark Marin. He's a stand-up comedian, and he's very—he's um, that time of the type of laugh at me and how sad I am type of stand-up comedian. I love that though. Uh, yeah, and he's—he's he's a great podcast interview. His podcast is called WTF, and it's been around for over ten years. He's—he's um, he's kind of arguably the guy who got interview style podcast really off the ground. He's done over a thousand episodes. And uh, I know back in 2015, he interviewed Barack Obama while he was the president. So he's obviously fairly popular. I hadn't heard about him until um, say a year ago, but Mm -hmm. he's uh, his interview style is pretty interesting. He does a lot of uh, celebrities um, or a lot more comedians. I would say people you might not know, but some of them you would know. So they're, uh, and he does long form interviews. So they're all about an hour and a half. I need to check that out then. It's yeah. He's WTF? good. WTF. WTF. Okay. I'll yeah. remember that. Uh, and Dak Shepard has a really good podcast as well called okay. armchair expert, where he talks to, uh, celebrities and friends of his and, uh, they, they just chat about all kinds of stuff. And then at the end, he has a section called the fact check where they make sure that nothing they said was incorrect during the podcast, That's which so I appreciate yeah. because we live in the era of fake news and, mm-hmm. uh, and he tries That's to make sure out. that they don't misquote anything during the podcast, which is great. That's so nice. I think this, uh, some of my psychology professors, they actually have a podcast that I've been listening to. Um, yeah. And it's, it's really interesting because you... Now I know someone who has a podcast, which is you. Um, <laughs> and then I met those two because they were my professors. So it's it's crazy like being like, oh, they have a podcast. Oh, I know them in real life. <laughs> it's the era of podcasts. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a very easy way to transition to um, having content for people to listen to. And we're in a time where there is absolutely a need for that because – people can't be as connected as they were before. I mean, it's, um, you know, the most contact people have right now is sitting on somebody's porch six feet away from them and chatting with them. Um, But even then you got to make sure, you know, you're not uh, getting contaminated in any way. I I know I had to go and trade a bunch of uh, puzzles with my aunt and uncle recently, and we had to like place them on their porch and then like pick up the stuff they were giving to us with, you know, gloves and then bring it home and disinfect it. And, Uh. um, that is the way that we currently have to communicate with people. I think we'll remember this though, and we'll be like, it's just, I, we won't take it for granted anymore, which is nice. Absolutely not. No, I, you know, like the, the human connection that I think a lot of people are realizing they miss right now is mm-hmm. going to mean people are going to make more time for each other, hopefully uh, down the line, which is yeah. great because I know technology, it's kind of funny how that has been the thing that I think has created more distance between people. Um, Mm. But now very much it's being used to keep people together, right? That's how we're talking today. This is recorded online. We're not in the same room. We, um, and this wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago or however long ago, you know? Mm -hmm. I completely agree. It's so crazy when I even think about it. Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully we can get back to uh, semi-normality at some point in the not-too-distant future. Um, we've kind of – I was watching the uh, federal or provincial government's update this afternoon, and we had four days in a row of declines in cases in Ontario, and then today was an increase again. But hopefully that means we're starting to kind of peak and uh, 
that will hopefully allow for things to get back to normal at some point soon. Mm -hmm, so, uh, yeah, when that happens, I suppose I'll see you back on campus for yes. some club risk assessment meetings or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, we can get back to everything we do on campus that, uh, you know, you can get back to all of your events that are for students actually on campus and, um, things will be good again. Yeah. I'm, I've actually, it hasn't even happened yet, but I'm looking forward to it a lot. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today and uh, hopefully I'll see you in person soon. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye.